Good afternoon, good evening, and good morning, everyone, wherever you might be. I am Rob Burgess, and I'm Chief Business Officer for Sino Biological. And it's my pleasure and honor to host the next installment in the Sino Bio Lock and Key webinar series on immunodetection. We have a very exciting technology and an even more exciting speaker for you today. And the focus is going to be on AI-mediated antibody design. So I'm going to introduce our speaker in just a second, but I want to mention we have just one brief housekeeping issue. And that is specifically, we're going to withhold questions until the end of the seminar, and we ask you to type your questions into the chat box. And at the close of the seminar, when Dr. Pan is finished, I will verbally ask the questions of Dr. Pan and allow her to answer them verbally so she doesn't have to scroll through the chat. So again, just type your questions into the chat box and at the close of the seminar, we will run through your questions. So thank you very much. We still have people joining us. We have a great turnout today. And it is without further ado that it is my honor and pleasure to introduce to everyone today, Dr. Lu Rong Pan, who is the founder and CEO of A Innocence. She is also the current director of computational science at Integrated Systems Center at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. And previously, she has held the positions of senior investigator at the Global Health Drug Discovery Institute and research scientist at the University of Alabama, Birmingham. Dr. Pan received her BS in Applied Chemistry from Nanjing University, her master's in Computer Science from Georgia Tech University in Atlanta, and finally her doctorate in Chemistry from the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And the title of Dr. Penn's talk today is AI Design Mutation Resistant Broad Neutralization Antibodies Against Multiple COVID-19 Strains. And so with that, Dr. Penn, I'll turn it over to you and I'll stop sharing my screen so that you can share yours and give your seminar. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you, Rob. Um, you guys hear me fine, right? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your wonderful intro introduction. And uh, let me share my screen. And welcome everybody's attendance um, from different time zoom. I uh, hope this topic could be fun and um, interesting. And, um, uh, and, and we take a very uh, radical and different approach for antibody discovery and hope um, this opens the door to a new um, um, like parading of how to dis uh, discover antibody and maybe potentially we can um, develop some collaborations in different type of form. Uh, so uh, can you guys he uh, see my screen um, clearly? Yes, it looks great, Dr. Pan. Okay, all right, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so today's my, uh, my topic is AI designed uh, mutation resistant uh, broadly neutralizing antibody against multiple uh, <clears throat> SARS-CoV-2 strains. Um, so the, um, so, so I mentioned the term mutation resistant is uh, we, we basically have a assumption, uh, a hypothesis that um, if we learn um, like the evolutionary track uh, of um, the, the virus at a certain time period, uh, we'll be able to learn how it evolves so that we will be able to design antibody uh, that also have binding um, to the future antigen uh, strains. Uh, and so in order for uh, to test that, uh, we, we, um, we couldn't really do it in, in a conventional way that uh, we, we basically go um, to um, a certain lab to, to inject uh, animal or, or certain in vitro assay to, uh, to test each of every SARS-CoV strain to generate antibody and then isolate them and then test them and screen them to find all those commonly applicable antibodies, but um, it's easier to do it um, in silicon. Uh, so based on that assumption, that's why we have that study in the first place and hope we can find uh, some answers uh, using different approach. Um, and the background of this study is, uh, first of all, we know that um, 
as previously um, last year when uh, the COVID-19 is just outbreak, there were several uh, monoclonal antibody uh, product has been um, assigned for emergency use in, in both um, like US and, and, uh, and EU. And uh, however, um, during the course of this uh, pandemic, uh, they, uh, the, the viral strains has evolved uh, dramatically, uh, goes through the initial B1 and uh, alpha and delta and currently Omicron and some other new strains. And, and a lot of those um, experimental or approved antibody shows uh, weaker and weaker um, effects. Uh, so based on that, we, we think uh, for future pandemic prop, uh, properties, we need to find, find a new way to really uh, develop antibody that can cover at least a longer window of this evolutionary process. Um, so that, that's why we, we designed this experiment. Uh, and, and briefly speaking, what we have done is uh, we analyze um, the, uh, all the uh, sequence of uh, the, uh, the, the virus um, especially it's uh, a spike protein uh, where that's the uh, monoclonal neutralizing antibody uh, bonds primarily. Uh, and then we, um, in last year, in October, we, we did the first trial and that's about 1,300 different strains. That's um, uh, the information is deposited in public domain. And then we took this and then uh, it, for each of them, we, we analyze all their uh, spike protein um, sequences, and then we find all the variants and did the test, uh, did the in vitro calculation across all of them. Um, and then we find, uh, we uh, in silico, uh, finally find all the uh, antibodies that has cross-binding activities against all those uh, different uh, antigens. Uh, and then we, we select the top ones uh, expressed um, and with the help of Sinobiologic, uh, we successfully expressed all the um, antibodies and then test them in, Lys in ELISA binding assay. And then later on, we ship them to um, actually um, uh, where I am right now, University of Alabama, Birmingham Southern Research Institute uh, for a real virus um, assay uh, to test the neutralization effect. Uh, and then we get some really interesting results that I would like to share today. So. Uh, let, let's uh, let's start it from the beginning. Uh, so the story start. Um, so I, I don't know if you guys um, maybe some of you have um, in this field uh, in the virology um, study that there's this common website uh, called um, like uh, G, uh, like GRSAID, uh, which is uh, normally uh, uh, store the uh, flu. Uh, sequence information because the seasonal flu is constantly changing. So people are uh, just uh, all over the world deposit um, their, their uh, sequence, the flu strains in this database. Uh, and when the COVID started um, and all the COVID test results has been also collected internationally uh, in, on this website. And then there's this uh, portal called the Next Strain, uh, which is, uh, I, I believe it hosted by the uh, Swiss Institute of Bio Bioinformatics. Uh, they, uh, they basically take all the information from the GISAID uh, database, uh, like, um, like constantly, uh, and then they analyze uh, the trend of evolution um, along the time of, the, uh, uh, of this um, pandemic event. And you can see from this graph that from uh, the different color represent a different distinct strains. Uh, from beta alpha and uh, delta kappa and all the way omicron uh, currently. Uh, and then also they, they show the geologic distribution of all the strains uh, that has been reported from different continents and countries. And you would also see a pattern that on different continents, um, there is a combination of different strains um, and, um, and in, the, in the time, during the time moves, uh, the, the proportions of each of them are uh, changed as well. On, on the, see, if you can see on, on this graph on the, um, on the bottom of this image, you will see from, uh, there's just one time window from last year, April uh, to uh, like March this year. And you can see uh, the predominant um, strings has evolved um, very dramatically. Uh, from um, pr uh, primarily alpha to Omicron, just during one course of a year. And, and right now, uh, completely dominated by Omicron, uh, the ma majority of the, uh, the species. 
And then it just take about a year. Uh, we, we go through three uh, major uh, dominant uh, strains that would have profound impact on therapeutic antibodies uh, against the, this type of um, virus. And on, in the middle, if you can see that's the, um, it's like a diversity measurement of how many mutants on each genome uh, of the virus. And the uh, particular Clearly, we're interested in the S protein, which is the um, um, the um, um, the vehicles that uh, cause the um, the host binding in infection process, and also the neutralizing antibody was primarily uh, targeted on this um, S protein. Uh, so, and also you can see uh, because it's in associated with the infectious pro uh, process uh, and interact the most with the host. Uh, ecosystem. That's why the, uh, the S protein is also the most evolving um, genome of the whole um, uh, gene, uh, among the whole, whole, whole genome sequence of the COVID-92. And then you would say that it's, uh, it's really um, almost every site on the S protein has a, uh, has a, a large number of mutation going on. Uh, during the course of evolution, and and then that's our uh, study is focused on is uh, is on the sequence of the S protein. Uh, so here is like a overall or, um, discovery process of this um, uh, study. Uh, so primarily, there are three steps we're taking uh, to uh, to discover uh, the, uh, the those uh, neutralizing antibody. Uh, first of all, we we have to do a, a data curation. Uh, which involve in, like I said earlier on the previous website, we have to uh, download all the sequence of the S protein of all their uh, historical um, evolutionary track. Uh, and then uh, we have to uh, find a specific sequence for the antibody binding epitope, uh, which we uh, focus on the S1 portion, which is the uh, a receptor binding region, uh, short for RBD region of the of the, this protein, uh, and then after analyze that, we find uh, 64 different uh, RBD variants uh, among all the uh, mutation strains. Uh, so we we have done the first batch of uh, data curation on uh, October uh, last year uh, when the Delta was. Uh, um, the primary um, uh, prevalent um, strain. And then we, we have done another batch of calculation uh, this year um, to generate another batch of antibody uh, uh, because the data uh, has been changed as well. So this is the, like the first step is you, you curate uh, all the data from the beginning to the current time moment. Uh, and then you, you, you have all the antigen sequence available for you for the next step uh, for the AI computation. Uh, so the computation of the AI part is actually uh, quite straightforward because uh, um, I know since we have this um, uh, uh, Sentinus uh, AI platform that we already trained uh, like, uh, like thousands of antibody that be able to predict uh, the antibody affinity to any given antigen strains. So, and that was um, that was actually a sequence-based antibody affinity model, uh, which is different from uh, the previous um, like biophysics-based structural-based uh, algorithm. So, we use a, um, a algorithm very um, similar to uh, in the AI field we call uh, natural language processing uh, type of. Um, uh, sequence-based uh, neural network model to train our historical binding data in order to generate uh, this uh, predictive uh, predictive model for for the calculation of the uh, binding affinity, uh, which is really fast because we can calculate uh, a few thousand um, uh, antigen antibody interaction pairs in just a few uh, minutes. Uh, so in that case, we we be able to really calculate a large number of possible antibody uh, sequences against those um, 64 different antigen strengths. So initially we have done basically uh, uh, 64 antigen sequences against 10 over or six magnitude of antibody uh, candidates. And those candidates are generated uh, using um, the uh, a common FAC region. And also we, we just only uh, enumerate the difference 
different possibility of mutants on the CDR3 and uh, two regions primarily. Uh, and that's how it's being generated and then, and then calculated. Uh, so, and based on that amount of candidate space, uh, we uh, score those antibody in a way that uh, we ranked by affinity first, and then we ranked by the cross banding rate, which means this antibody can bind to all uh, 64 uh, antigens, not just one with high strong affinity. So we have done two batch of exercise, just repeat the same thing. Uh, twice on October, we selected uh, 50 uh, antibody sequences and on February, we selected 20 sequences. And then, uh, so totally we have about 70 uh, antibody uh, that is AI designed. Uh, and then we'll, we will have to uh, express them and then test their properties. Uh, so we, uh, so here, uh, Sinobiologics are the ones that help us to uh, successfully express the, all the antibody sequence. Um, and then uh, with, with a good um, abandoned amount, be able to test uh, multiple uh, tests and uh, followed. So we have done a ELISA test uh, and then uh, both the one dose and dose dependent dependent um, EC50 uh, assay. And then we have done a pseudoviral uh, neutralizing test uh, with the Sinobiologics as well. And then eventually um, we shipped all those uh, antibody to Sun Research have done a real virus neutralizing assay uh, on both Delta and Omicron strain. Uh, so that's the whole um, process of, the, of this uh, study. Uh, and for the time, Time point, it's like we, we spent about a couple of weeks to, uh, to finish the computational part because um, they, um, they, the nature of computational studies relatively uh, is pretty, um, you know, uh, we, don't, we don't limit it by any logistic or any uh, wet lab um, uh, repetitivity problem. So we, we, once we have the, have, have the idea, we, we have the right way to curate the data and then we, we do the prediction pretty straightforward and then uh, we generate the sequence. Uh, and then we spend about um, two months to finish the expression and some um, uh, enzymatic assay. Uh, and then we, we spend another uh, couple of weeks on the real uh, viral test. Uh, and in between are some logistic connection uh, time cost. So the whole process, if we if we done in within one uh, one lab, it could be finished like in in two months. Uh, so that's that's quite fast. Uh, I think it's uh, this way of uh, antibody discovery is really uh, much quicker than the conventional phage phage display or animal um, like um, immunization uh, assay that you have to 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 wait and to, uh, to establish some real uh, antibody library and to do um, a lot of uh, different um, uh, wildlife experiments with, with a lot of like money and time cost. And normally um, they, the chance of finding the, the ideal uh, antibody uh, are, are probably not um, really uh, that predictable. So some antigen you can find really good binders, but some you might not have that luck. So, uh, and we're trying to establish this whole computational and wet lab um, process in a way that we can we can have a uh, small turnaround uh, of trial and error, and also uh, we'll be able to really um, improve the process uh, very quickly uh, with uh, with very short iteration uh, of coming. So of the uh, the the data feedback loop. Uh, from the wet lab and back to the computational uh, uh, um, uh, experiment. So, uh, so basically, when we done the two batch of experiments, the first uh, fifty uh, sequence, the the testing result has go back to our AI model for the the next, uh, the second round of computation, uh, which uh, later you will say that it's really boosted the uh, the result uh, a lot as well. Uh, so that we think this, um, we call it the dry and wet lab iteration uh, would be a, a future trend for, uh, for any type of um, tool antibody or therapeutic antibody discovery. Uh, so here um, I may give a little bit background uh, about our, um, uh, some benchmark of our model, because um, we take a very radical approach of using only the sequence um, to, uh, to compute the binding affinity 
instead of using a very conventional, um, which we probably a lot of you or, or myself has been trained in graduate school that we have to first get the 3D structure and then find the epitope on antigen and then to, to do a uh, kind of simulations between the antibody 3D structure and the antigen stru 3D structure. And then after that protein-protein docking process, and then we, we calculate the free energy change of each mutant on the uh, antibody. So that's kind of the conventional way to do. And that's all, all those tools has been um, the, 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 uh, basically the, the mechanism behind it. Uh, and then uh, here is a benchmark test we have done on like a thousand, about a thousand antibody um, antigen test pair that they have the free energy change data uh, for a, a single or double mutants. Uh, so the delta delta G in kick is the is basically what uh, we tested here. Uh, and you can see the accuracy of the previous uh, structure-based model uh, are uh, varies from uh, tools to tool. Uh, and also by different um, like uh, delta delta G window. So in general, you can just say this column is just in any any type of delta G change, regardless of um, the uh, degree of, of of change of such change. It's kind of um, in about 0.6 to 0.7 percent of uh, AURC um, on in the conventional tool. But in in our model, for a given known target, uh, which means we uh, this targets, uh, this sequence uh, of this antigen has been seen in our training set. Uh, this um, the accuracy boost about fifteen percent uh, across the line. Um, and for a new target, which means the AI has never seen the sequence of this antigen in its training set, um, then we can still reach a relatively uh, good uh, performance uh, about among point seventy percent and up. So that which is close to the best model in the uh, in the current state of the art biophysics uh, computational tools, uh, but what what's different is uh, we don't really need the structure and we don't need to know the epitope uh, because there's a um, conventionally this this method in structure based antibody design has a dilemma, uh, which is if you if you say you know an epitope uh, that has been measured one way or another, and then you, uh, based on that epitope, you, you, you change your antibody sequence. Um, and, then, and then when you measure that interaction in the same epitope, any given mutation, uh, for example, if they have a negative change on the affinity uh, based on your model on the same epitope, but in my, uh, the reality may be um, actually this, this mutant uh, has a better affinity to another epitope. <laughs> so that in this case, um, uh, if you only focus one epitope of calculation, and you will also have a lot of false negative in your, in your sample result. Uh, but, and, and also it's impossible for you to calculate every single epitope against every single mutation on the antibody. Uh, so that, that's the limitation of the, the protein protein docking problem. One, actually, but in our algorithm, we because we learned the whole sequence of the antigen, uh, so that we learned all potential epitopes on the sequence against all potential um, antibody um, uh, mutation sequence. Uh, so in that case, we avoided that uh, local minimum problem, um, and then to to be able to really predict a the, the global uh, binding uh, problem in this way, uh, but. But in another way, it's, it's hard to, uh, for biophysicists to really uh, explain uh, what exact interaction has happened um, that uh, without knowing the 3D structure, but, but that's the thing of, um, uh, I think the, uh, one controversial part about AI is uh, most of the AI model cannot be explained by conventional um, experience. Um, because there are multi-dimensional uh, problems, uh, which human can only rationalize in, in a 3D space and can only rationalize by one rule or, or several rules at a time, but we cannot really rationalize a thousand parameters at a time. Uh, that's, that's the thing, but, uh, but ultimately we would like to wet lab validate our data and to say if this, uh, this black box of AI really, uh, really makes sense. Uh, another comparison is we uh, we have done to uh, for the conventional model is if we 
we can really calculate a, a vast mutation space um, so that and this AI can be more powerful in the way of, in, in terms of computational efficiency. Uh, so we, what we have done is, um, for example, if we would like to uh, numerate all possible changes on a, um, for example, CDR3 region, which covers about 20 amino acids. Uh, and then if we do a single site mutant, it's about a hundred, um, like hundreds of possibility, um, like 400 strictly speaking. Uh, and then if it's, a double site um, mutation, it will be like uh, tens over four magnitude. And then if a triple set is, is 10 over six. And then, so if it's for five sites, it's reaches about um, the, um, our real B cell um, generated uh, population of antibody diverse is about 10 over 10 times. Uh, so this, this, uh, this sequence space normally is really impossible for a conventional structure based computational tool to reach, but, um, but that's the kind of in vivo diversity of our antibody of our at a whole um, immune response. And the 10 over eight is about a one single fish display uh, library would normally cover. Uh, so, but you can say that uh, if we're using um, conventional tools uh, that uh, we, what we can, the limit of our calculation is about double site, which already would, uh, would would do like about a hundred day for a on a single GPU, uh, which really not that doable. But if we would like to really enumerate ten over ten different possible sequence space, we would have to adopt a just a, a simplified and more efficient uh, trained AI model. So um, we benchmarked our uh, sequence space model that for the single site uh, calculation just take a few minutes. And for the double site, it take about six minutes, and for the triple site, it take about uh, less than an hour. Uh, and for the um, for the uh, eight and ten, it's in days. But if we do uh, like parallel computing, uh, it, it can be done in a few days as well. So, but it's in a very um, uh, manageable. Uh, like time frame, and we also calculate the computational cost by how many like um, core hours, which means your cloud computing cost uh, for this type of calculation. The conventional physics based model would cost like uh, at least ten thousand times more expensive of uh, the same compute computing task uh, than our current AI uh, analysis AI model. Uh, so what what does that mean? Is if we want to calculate the same amount of antibody sequence. We would cost um, it, uh, we cost one dollar, and the other uh, tools would cost like ten thousand dollars. That's the the difference on the cloud computing, uh, and that's why we we really um, think uh, this is a good way to to promote this technology for uh, for the industry instead of mostly in the past uh, those uh, computationally heavy tax was only done in, in academia because you only need to calculate like study one mechanism of one protein. So you don't really have to enumerate that, mu that many possibility, but in industry setting, we have to really consider the computational economics, uh, which also to save uh, power and save trees. <laughs> so that's, that's kind of what we ad advocate in our technology roadmap as well. And then, uh, so what we have actually done is, like I said earlier, uh, so we have done uh, about um, six, four different strains, and then uh, on the um, on about a triple of uh, or four site mutagenesis. Uh, so we we have done two batches of, of them. The first one, uh, we we took about fifty out of all the possible uh, binders, uh, and the second batch for the Omicron um, included sequence, uh, we we take uh, twenty of them. And then, uh, so here is the um, ELISA result for a single dose of um, uh, maturated uh, test on the measurement of, uh, of uh, OD450. Um, uh, so you could say that we have two controls, uh, three controls actually. Uh, so the black ones are the uh, therapeutic antibody has been approved uh, by one of the company. And then the, the red one, uh, I'm sorry, the uh, aqueous one are po a positive control. And the, the last one is a negative control so that we would know in each uh, measurement how it goes. So the first um, row is the wild tag which is uh, the original uh, strain um, outbreak in Wuhan. And this is the hit rate you can see from our um, 
uh, from our computed 50 antibody, a majority of them are close to the positive um, uh, control, um, like uh, affinity level. So uh, the hit rate is, is pretty high. And then for the, uh, for the Delta, you can see the same trend. It's, it's mostly stay very potent binding. Uh, and for the Omicron, you would say that the population of strong binders are decreased, but we still have uh, a few uh, that has a better uh, binding affinity than the uh, approved medicine uh, and uh, close to the, the, um, the positive control. Uh, so in that case, you would say that our, uh, we call the hit rate uh, is really high. It's like about 40% have triple corresponding um, among the other three. And, and this, is, this one is important is because we have done all the calculation uh, pre-Omicron, which means we, we haven't really involved the antigen sequence of Omicron when we do this batch of selection. Uh, so which, uh, which we, we would say uh, to, to be able to have a good result on um, the Wuhan virus and the Delta variants, we think it's predictable and it's, it's pretty good, uh, the hit rates. But um, the surprisingly, the, uh, the sequence of the Omicron is really drastically different than the Delta strain, uh, but it still remain a pretty good amount of binding uh, antibody, which uh, we would think it's it's really truly uh, mutation resistant in the, in this case. No matter we apply um, all those antibodies as, as a cocktail or just uh, either one of those um, those strong binders would really demonstrate a, a good therapeutic potential or diagnostic potential. Uh, and then this is uh, on the right. Uh, this is the second batch. Uh, so. Uh, that we have done in February, which already have Omicron antigen sequence involved. Uh, and then we, uh, we have included the first batch of results uh, the, and then to, to do the second AI computation. And you would say that um, we have a pretty good um, across binding affinity and then the cross binding rate is about 40%. So it, it's increased about uh, 26% uh, that, um, that after we feed in the first batch of ex uh, experimental data. Um, and uh, so we only need to test about 20 antibodies. That's what we have uh, estimated at the time that we don't really uh, need to do another 50 to, to be able to find good binders. Uh, so that's, that's kind of that, that batch of uh, experiment result. Uh, and more specifically, we have uh, also done a dose-dependent uh, ELISA result, uh, like binding test on uh, a control, uh, uh, and also our uh, the two different batches of um, uh, the top top ones. So here, um, I think the the icon probably a little small, but uh, the the triangle um, purple one uh, is the Omicron, um, uh, like uh, one. Uh, one uh, nanogram per mil uh, concentration uh, of the antigen test. So that one you would say that's uh, for the uh, the control is it's mostly you mostly lose all the activities um, for but uh, even those ones has the uh, um, the delta and the wild type uh, still remain activity. Uh, but for our um, the the first batch, the, those two antibodies, uh, you could say that the the both the wild type and delta, uh, and also the omicron remains uh, similar um, log of magnitude of binding affinity, even uh, with the slight uh, slight decrease, but still kind of remain uh, similar uh, trend. And for the last batch of calculation. Uh, the, the top ones are, are fairly close. Um, for example, those two are almost remain the same affinity against the, the three different uh, types. Um, so that's kind of um, uh, on the affinity end, uh, we have come to get this uh, uh, good result. Uh, and that's also what we calculate. But the, for the neutralization effect, we really have no idea because uh, uh, everybody knows the affinity does not, not necessarily translate to neutralizing uh, effect. Um, and all our training set are on the uh, binding affinity data, uh, not the actual cell-based assay data. Uh, and then here is the real virus result. Uh, so on the, on the left, that's the first uh, 50. Uh, that's the batch one. Uh, uh, we, we have done Delta and Omicron. So here on the Delta strain test, 
uh, we sent uh, the first uh, 50 antibodies and actually 10 of them has less than 10 uh, microgram per mole um, of, um, per meal, I'm sorry, it's a typo. Uh, of um, IC, IC50, which those are the uh, most the strong ones. And, and the, the strongest ones about 2.7 nanograms. So, and and I think the key key is the, the heterogeneity is really high uh, that, that it's, it's really lower the cost of, of the process of funding neutralizing um, antibodies. Um, and then we, uh, we also tested all the antibodies on the Omicron strain, uh, but unfortunately we only found one with the uh, microgram level affinity, I'm sorry, um, inhibition, uh, but still it's, it's also in a therapeutic um, use uh, like window that's uh, this, <clears throat> this value. And this one is the, is we call the, uh, the broadly neutralizing antibodies, the 31, uh, which is also the strongest on the Delta strain. Uh, and this is all the data we get so far from wild lab validation. Um, and then we, uh, we think this, uh, this by far, so far is, is pretty good um, uh, result. And um, uh, especially for the binding test, it's, uh, it's already uh, improved a lot. And for the neutralizing effect, it's, it's, it's quite a, a complex process, uh, not just for the binding, but also there's a bunch of other reasons contribute to the uh, eventual um, uh, result. Uh, so here we, we, we have a few um, takeaways uh, that, um, and that our team can, uh, had, had learned from this, but uh, we, we probably would like to investigate more if there's uh, further uh, resource to, to extend this study. Uh, first is we, we can definitely uh, design antibodies with um, uh, with in vitro efficacies and drastically reduce the time and costs of the engineering, uh, such as affinity maturation using the AI technology involved. Um, even just play 50% of the role, but it's already um, kind of save us a lot of time and money. Uh, and also uh, AI can is, is able to design a cross-binding antibody, uh, which is really hard to do in a, the pure wet lab settings. Uh, so we can really um, calculate antibody against many different antigen population as, as many as possible actually, uh, such as the viral mutant strain. But also uh, we can also screen off targets for any given antibody uh, doing the same, same thing. If we have uh, any tar targets uh, we know uh, uh, as a potential off target, uh, candidate we would like to avoid, or we even if we would like to screen the whole human um, like receptors or, or potential binder population, that's, that's doable as well. Uh, and the third one is um, there might be a hidden pattern in the viral evolution process that we can really learn uh, using advanced AI model, uh, no matter through uh, a, a type of binding data or some other type of data. Uh, that uh, we, so that we can design antibody that potentially being robust against the future viral strains. Um, so even um, at least in certain window. Uh, so that's kind of uh, what we, we have learned from, from this study. Uh, and then uh, after the study have done, we, we also um, explore a lot of different cases with uh, Sinobiologics on this type of new methodology, like the hybrid uh, AI plus uh, wet lab uh, methodology. So we think uh, not just for the COVID study, uh, we can really expand this methodology for a variety of uh, future applications, such as the, um, all the other uh, viral uh, antibody or, or diagnose or tool antibodies uh, or or any other fusion protein modification project as well. Uh, so that, that, that could really open a lot of doors for this uh, type of technology to, to really uh, help the industry bring its uh, efficiency up and to have more exciting discoveries. Uh, so we have come, uh, come partnership together uh, to kind of um, um, assembled a, a, a full process of this, uh, antibody uh, discovery service. Uh, so what <clears throat> the whole process is actually quite simple. Uh, so if a client uh, give us a, um, a sequence of a, an uh, antigen or some 
human protein target of interests, um, they they would either like to uh, screen from scratch of some potential antibody uh, or or some other nanobody of, of any fusion protein kind to to bind to this antigen. We 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 will be able to um, generate those sequence, or uh, if you have a uh, already uh, developed um, a group of antibody um, that you you think their therapeutic or other properties are not ideal, you would like to make improvement, uh, and then we can combine those two informations to do um, the um, uh, computational tests, just like the case study I just showed you guys. Uh, so in that case, um, uh, we, we can really calculate anything that really can, as long as it can be expressed or it can be tested in a wet lab one way or another uh, to, to bring that to the wet lab. So normally uh, we can, um, so, so here we have developed a bunch of different modules uh, in uh, bioanalysis uh, AI team for a fast in silico affinity maturation, like I just uh, demonstrated. And also we, uh, we can do immunization evaluation and do a quick de-immunization modification on your antibody sequence. And we can do off-target screening uh, and we can do uh, stability prediction as well. Uh, so all those properties can be uh, in silico cal uh, calculated within about two weeks time. Um, and then uh, in our um, past experience, we. Uh, we can really identify a better candidate or uh, a initial hits for you less uh, within less than ten antibodies of uh, of um, of testing range, uh, so that you don't really have to establish a a phage library or any kind to to really screen anything new. Uh, and then here um, the synobiologics they would uh, with their fast um, and and uh, specialize the protein expression engine, uh, and then have all kind of um, uh, um, anti antigen and antibody expression, and then the the binding test uh, they can pro uh, provide it, and and then with a report of a cycle, uh, which could um, be about one or two months, and and then uh, the reports uh, will go back to the AI engine to either further um, uh, propose more uh, better candidates. Or you could just go to the customer. That's okay. We get already get the uh, the, the the desired um, product. Um, so that whole service uh, model is, uh, I think, it's quite quite novel, uh, and we we think it, it would be a great partnership that we we together to to help um, different uh, type of uh, uh, group to to discover their therapeutic or other purpose uh, of um, of anti. Ready. I think the power of this is uh, first, um, well, we will really be able to optimize uh, different properties at one time and calculate um, the antibody against different antigen strains at the same time. This uh, to, to basically pre screen a lot of concerns you might have in your later uh, therapeutic development. Uh, and the second is since the um, throughput of your uh, experiment can be reduced dramatically. So the cost and time um, you can, can be saved uh, dramatically. So that uh, which uh, for a lot of, um, I think, um, a small biotech or even academic lab, it could be more affordable. Um, and uh, so I think that's several advantages I can think of. Um, and then, so currently we have offered the, uh, the joint service and also uh, we, we also uh, have our, our pure like computational um, type of service as well and see if we, we can um, find anybody that could also, if you have some very customized special case that conventional method cannot be solved, we're willing to uh, talk about more uh, customized solution as well. All right, um, I think that's all my uh, presentation today and um, welcome for any questions. Great. Thank you, Dr. Pan. That was a wonderful seminar you just gave on very cutting edge technology, probably one of the best we've ever had. We really appreciate it. And I think you and I think a lot alike because I was going to mention our partnership too after your seminar, but before the question session and you beat me to it and you did a much better job than I can. So <laughs> oh, no problem. <laughs> Thank you very much for presenting that. And I 
before everybody starts jumping off, I just want to say reach out directly to A Innocence or to Sino Biological if you would like to try a project that combines their artificial intelligence based technology with our wet bench manufacturing and validation technologies. We would love to work with you on that. So, wonderful stuff. I'm going to jump right into the questions here because I know we have a little bit of a limited time. Forgive me. Hey, Dr. Penn, if, if some of these you actually work through and answer during your seminar, uh, but I'm going to go ahead and ask them anyway. We have some good questions from Ryan Henrici, if I pronounced Ryan's name right. Ryan asks, can you please provide more information about the trained model? And that is, what was the training data set? Was it all simulated docking experiments or was it real wet lab data? Oh, yeah, that's a great question. Yeah, all our training set are wet lab um, SPR data, high quality SPR data. Okay. So that's, that's the, we think, the most reliable type of data. Uh, and then we have done a lot of cleaning and calibration. And also we have separated the protein family in a way that could be more specific uh, for each type of antigen. So that's um, that's kind of our, our core expertise on, 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 on this end. And, and we don't take any simulated um, uh, biophysics data because we don't think they are accurate in the first place. Uh, but uh, but we, we, uh, it, we sometimes use that for some kind of a post-calculation explanation to see if our mutant uh, make any um, like uh, structural biology sense. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. okay, great, thanks. And Ryan's second question is, are these antibody sequences fully synthetic via generative models or are they matured from seeing antibodies from existing repertoires? Yeah, so for the FAC region, they are saying in the existing um, like uh, repertory and, uh, and for the CDR regions are uh, generated. Okay. Yeah, okay, but, but, but we have done, uh, we have certain like uh, features to make sure even they are artificially simulated, but they can still can be expressed. Uh, that's why it's being expressed uh, successfully. Yeah, because uh, you have to counter that some art artificially um, like generated sequence might may not pass through a lot of different um, expression system um, to be able to be expressed. Yeah. Right. Okay. Great. And and then Ryan's third question, which I think is a good one. How many mutations away from the repertoire are your best binders on average? Can you answer that? Um, well, we haven't really calculated um, specifically for that, uh, but uh, we, um, so yeah, I, I'll get back to it. Yeah, I think it's a very, yeah, we didn't really calculate the number, yeah. No worries at all. Ryan can reach out to you directly. Oh, right? Yeah, we can, yeah, we will have to do that analysis, I think. Mm -hmm. Fernando Barroso just asked, are there published references that maybe he could read regarding the model performance comparison data? Uh, yeah, we, uh, we, we just wrote a patent, so we're about to have a publication in like a couple of months, yeah. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. great. Great. And then again, another one from Ryan. I hate for him to hog all our time, but he's got some good ones here. So your models are then only using linear primary sequence information. That's correct, isn't it? Yeah, that's correct. Right. Okay. Great. Mm -hmm. Bobby Fletcher asked a question that I think may be related to Bitcoin mining although it's not my area, and that is, are the CPU usages on your computers more elevated than usual? Um, okay, so it's like uh, we have, um, it depends on our model. So we have tried different algorithms. Some are more CPU friendly, some are more GPU friendly. So mm -hmm. when, we, when we really uh, do the prediction, we were uh, like, it depends on the version of our model, we will choose GPU or CPU. But, uh, but our um, uh, computational cost was, uh, was really low because we, uh, majority of the time we use the parallel CPU so that we can get result faster. Uh, and uh, and it's, it's really not, because it's, it's, it's almost a linear computational complexity if, if any of you have computer science background. So that's, it's really um, 
parallel in CPU will be more efficient. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and so, so we just, yeah, that, sure. that's how it goes. <laughs> Great, sounds good. And Connor Foster asks, the antibodies that bind to both Delta and Omicron, are they all binding at different epitopes or the same? Uh, we we actually think it should bind in different epitope, but since we didn't uh, tackle the structure, so we haven't really mapped back to the epitope yet. But we, uh, in our future publication, we will we will do that exercise and to mm -hmm. just to to find the, the the potential epitopes. Great, Alessandro Maschioni asks, "What's the average size for a training set for this type of AI model development?" Um, yeah, it's about I think uh, at least the fifty to a hundred thousand pairs would be sufficient. Yeah. Okay. Great, great. And Rutilio Clark asks: Has this method been applied to non-infectious disease targets such as CD three, for example? Uh, we haven't done that um, yet, but we are planning to to have a few actually demo case with Sino. So mm -hmm. I think we, we would find some target that's non-infectious disease and see if we can have another case study coming right. soon. Mm -hmm. Just a quick question for me. I've been in, interacting with one of your colleagues there. I'm just curious about the impact of your technology regarding just protein-protein interaction in general, like the proteome, for example, in mice. Mm -hmm. I know there's been a big initiative to map out protein-protein interactions. How mm -hmm. do you think a instance technology could impact that? Yeah, that's a good question. So we have been um, talk about that um, for, for the past weeks. Um, I think, um, so first of all, we know that uh, we, we only probably know about 11% of all the protein-protein interaction that is there uh, by the current technology that um, I think the recent science publication have revealed that using the East uh, East assay to do that um, type of uh, probing. Uh, but for the actual mass spec based protein protein interaction um, data, it's about, it's actually only like 1% that has been reviewed. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, definitely there is a large space for that type of uh, interaction. And we, uh, and theoretically speaking, um, if we have, let's say we have like, uh, 20,000 human genome, which reflects about uh, 40,000 to 800,000 different proteins. And we have all those sequences already known. Uh, so we can, if we do a matrix calculation, it would be like uh, the maximum is um, 800,000 times 800,000 <laughs> of possible combinations of, of the pairs. Wow. And that's, as it's actually doable in a computational sense. Uh, so that um, if we really do that, and we'll be able to see some heat map or patterns of of the potential protein-protein uh, interactions that is there, uh, maybe we'd have new discovery just by doing that alone. Um, I think uh, we, uh, we're, we're currently building that uh, database for all the human genome sequence and try to clean them in a way that only those um, uh, regions on the sequence that could potentially interact with another, because a lot of, for example, transmembrane protein as such, they have a large domain that they really won't, won't possible to interact with another domain if they're not like extracellular or intracellular region. So we, we'll try to map those sequences out and, and, and try to do a comprehensive uh, scanning um, on at least the off-target screening. Um, in that case, we, we can at the same time do a protein-protein interactions for all, uh, for example, circular protein or in like a cytoplasmic protein as well. Uh, see if there's a possible, yeah, new findings. Yeah, we're, uh, we're kind of planning on that, yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. It's very exciting forward vision there. I want to get back to the questions from our attendees. Terry Lee Behan asked a great question about how close or far are the AI found antibody sequences compared to known binders? Like do you compare them to controls, for example? Um, like, uh, yeah, we have previously, I think we, if it's just affinity, like the, the known binders, for example, the blue one, uh, 
I'm sorry, the, the green one is the known boundaries. So Got that it. uh, it's kind of matching the, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Level right. of affinity, yeah. Proof of concept there, great question still though. Can you comment, this is from Steve Szynski, can you comment on the specificity of the antibodies? Do you see binding to control, any binding to control viruses or proteins? And I think this is a good question. And I wanted to follow up with that also is, can you modulate the binding affinity with AI to get something bind as tight as you want or as least tight as you want? Can you comment on that? Oh yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, actually, our AI model can uh, either increase the affinity or decrease the affinity by 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 doing the the type of screening. But for this particular study, because we would like not specific, we would like broad. Uh, so we have selected the the top binders for all of them. Uh, but if we do a, a counter selection, for example, you would only want antibody against like one strain and do not select any other strain, we can do a counter selection. So it, it's completely doable. It's, it depends on your need. Uh, we, we have, um, there's some, some of uh, our current client, they, they were thinking uh, to do like, just modify some protein uh, or by specifics to just um, with a very particular selectivity against a group of targets or, or, or increase their natural affinity to one group and decrease uh, increase one group and decrease another group on the same protein. <laughs> so there's, yeah, it depends on your request. I think it's all doable. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think this question is related to your last bullet point kind of on your summary slide is from Renato Mastra Janelli, if I pronounced that right. And, and that is, can you predict future spike protein evolution so I think you might have mentioned that, right? Okay, yeah, that's that's very interesting. So we are trying to um to to come up with an algorithm for that as well. And and when we first started the, the study, we uh we think it's like if we have a group of antibody known, for example, like like just one human at a whole antibody sequence from a B cell, and then we just state that diversity and then we we muted the antigen <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. instead of we muted the CDR region we can come up with different viral species that are best suited for that group of antibodies that be able to escape from it um, and that's the future evolutionary trend so I think um, by theory you can really do that it's just a uh, probably the computational cost could be uh, higher if I do it that way uh, another way is uh, we basically, um, there's algorithm that we can really set up just by learning the patterns of antigen itself uh, for the past evolutionary track. Uh, and, and then we know that certain regions on S protein are high, more evolved than the other. And we know the, the direction of the mutations. Um, we can like uh, at the big, actually at the beginning of the pandemic, we have learned the patterns in SARS and MERS and other coronavirus against um, the SARS-CoV-2, we already kind of see some patterns on the S protein. Like uh, there are about 40% of the entire S protein region are highly evolved and 60% are conserved. Uh, and then we, we also know we have the uh, residue counts for different type, like I showed it in the first strand. So it's, it's actually, I think it's somewhat predictable, um, like right here, uh, and also, yeah, we know it's it will be evolved more, mm -hmm. more infectious and less deadly. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's that's like fantastic. all the virus deaths. Uh -huh. A great uh, forward thinking use of your technology, and I, I think with that we've kind of run out of time. So I'm just going to wrap things up. Let me apologize to the remaining attendees who asked questions. We can get to your questions if you will email us directly at Sinobiological. We'll make sure they get to Dr. Penn and we'll get them uh, answered for you. Again, we had a huge turnout today, so we couldn't get to everybody's questions, but um, Dr. Penn, that was a wonderful seminar. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us. We, like I said, had many people from all over the world, Egypt, India, Pakistan, Saudi Arabia, Mexico, Uganda, 
Jordan, Sudan, Tanzania, and of course, all over the United States. Thank you all for joining us uh, on your evening or your morning, depending on wherever you might be. And I want to thank you, Dr. Pan, for a fantastic seminar and really more importantly for helping us in, in executing the partnership with Sino Biological, which really combines artificial intelligence with, I think, optimized wet bench manufacturing and validation of the finished product. So that's fantastic. Uh, and then finally, I want to thank my colleague at Sino Biological, Christine Lay, who actually set up this webinar and um, is the one who really executed it. So with that, thank you all again. And I think we will conclude this webinar. Goodbye. All right. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye.